Hello and welcome or welcome back to this third session of our ICENTD Climate and Health Conference. Uh, we've already heard a lot throughout the morning um, and, and over lunchtime <clears throat> about some of the gaps that exist between the sectors of climate and health, but also some really exciting partnerships and, all, and also really inspirationally about what can be done with data and modeling uh, to understand a bit better the relationship between climate and health, also understand where the diseases out and their outbreaks are, are going, and more importantly, to use this as a really solid evidence base um, for policy making and decision making. So I'm really looking forward to this panel. If you love data and you love models, this is the place to be for you. Uh, we've got a fantastic range of presentations. He'll be taking us uh, along a number of approaches and diseases. We'll be looking at dengue, leptospirosis um, throughout the next hour and a half. And for anybody who's working in health, um, who perhaps works on a disease with an element of seasonality in it, please uh, don't hesitate to ask your questions. Uh, hear more about these amazing projects and how to bring in climate data and climate variables into your work. So it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, to this panel, Professor Rachel Lowe, who's um, a research professor, the ICREA research professor at the, and as part of the Global Health Resilience Team at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, the BSC. Hello, Rachel. Hi there. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll also hear research from Dr. Raquel Lana, postdoctoral researcher, uh, also part of the Global Health Resilience Team at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Welcome, Raquel. Hello, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Um, we'll hear a presentation by Emily Finch, who's with the Center for Mathematical Modeling of Infectious Diseases at the London School of Hygiene and Medicine. Hi, Emily. Hi, everyone. You'll be talking to us about dengue outbreaks in Singapore. And finally, we'll hear from Martin Lotto Batista from the Helmholtz Center for Infection Research. And you'll be telling us all about an early warning system for leptospirosis in Argentina. So welcome, Martin, and thank you for joining us. Oh, the classic moment, you're on mute, Martin, but uh, it's okay. I think we heard you say hello to us <laughs> and we'll hear more from you uh, during your presentation. I'm just gonna hand over right now uh, to kick things off to uh, Professor Rachel Lowe. Uh, Rachel, over to you. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity to present in this conference. Um, I will just start my presentation. I'm going to present some of the work um, in our global health resilience team on uh, decision support tools to enhance public health resilience in climate change hotspots. So this is um, a representation of the uh, warming of global temperatures from 1850 um, through to present day. So here we can see um, temperature anomalies compared to a 1971 to 2000 baseline. And we can see that there's been a very dramatic warming of the global climate in the last few decades. And this has coincided with a dramatic expansion of vector-borne diseases such as dengue. In the 1970s, it was estimated around nine countries uh, had experienced severe outbreaks of the disease, and that number has now increased to over 120 countries and growing. Uh, we're starting to see outbreaks of dengue in places that were previously unaffected in, in Europe and in um, higher latitudes in, in the Americas. Uh, last year, we published a study um, projecting changes in the length of the transmission season and population at risk of the two most important vector-borne diseases, dengue and malaria. And we found that if global temperatures are to continue increasing to 3.7 degrees C by the end of the century, we could see an additional 4.7 billion people at risk of these diseases. Whereas if concerted mitigation action were to be taken to keep temperatures below one degree C, that number would be dramatically reduced. So it's not only the warming climate um, that is contributing to the spread of uh, diseases like dengue fever, 
uh, also increasing volume of um, passengers, humans moving around the globe, and an increase in travel and trade, which can allow um, invasive mosquito species to be um, introduced into new areas. This combined with the warming temperatures and more unpredictable and extreme events such as floods, droughts, and storms is changing the timing and intensity of infectious diseases. Here is an example of a study we conducted recently looking at the erosion of the transmission barriers to dengue. So uh, the cooler temperatures in the south of Brazil and the more remote, remote areas in the Amazon rainforest were previously protected from outbreaks of dengue. But in the last 10 years, and especially this year, we've seen severe outbreaks of dengue in the south of the country. And this is partly due to the warming of the temperatures. And in the Amazon rainforest, we are seeing um, better infrastructure and increased connectivity to the rest of the urban um, network in Brazil. For example, if we take the city of, of Manaus um, we, in the Amazon, we can see that over a 10-year period um, from 2007 to 2018, the city is much more connected to smaller areas in the Amazon, where we are seeing the emergence of um, diseases tra transmitted by Aedes along with outbreaks and hotspots of malaria transmission. So this year we published a scoping review uh, looking at evidence of outbreaks of climate sensitive infectious diseases following extreme climatic events such as tropical cyclones, droughts and floods. We found substantial evidence of links between waterborne diseases such as uh, diarrheal diseases and cholera and some emerging evidence of links between droughts and dengue fever for example. This image here is one of the most densely populated favelas in the city of Rio de Janeiro. And we can see that there are lots of uh, blue temporary water storage containers um, within this favela. And these uh, provide ideal breeding uh, sites for the Aedes mosquitoes, um, particularly in times of, of water shortage. This here is an image um, of a temporary water storage container that was implemented in the northeast city of, of Brazil during drought events. And we can see the conditions inside this container um, are perfect for um, increasing mosquito uh, populations. So following on from a study that we'd conducted in Barbados, where we uh, found this interesting link between drought events um, and the delayed impact on the risk of dengue outbreaks, we found a very similar pattern in Brazil, where four months after a drought event in urban areas, we could see an increased risk of dengue, as well as an increased risk immediately after extremely wet conditions. And this effect was exacerbated in urban areas, and we found uh, this was partially related to an increase in water shortage during droughts. So in urban areas um, that were reliant on, on the water network, when, this, uh, when the water supply was disrupted, more um, uh, households were having to rely on this temporary water storage. Whereas in more rural areas such as the Amazon, we found the link between extremely wet conditions and dengue was slightly more enhanced. So this kind of uh, climatic indicators, so looking at the combination of uh, short and long lag uh, hydrometeorological indicators, can help us improve the early, early warning system work that we conducted um, several years ago. This is an example of a prototype early warning system that was put together in 2014 ahead of the um, Football World Cup, combining seasonal climate forecasts with data from the dengue surveillance data at the time of forecast to produce a probabilistic forecast three months ahead of time. And we're hoping to improve this kind of system now by using these um, bespoke hydrometeorological indicators depending on the geographical setting to improve our predictions and guide mosquito control activities. So here we can see an example of, of a schematic of how this sort of model might work um, in the Caribbean. This is particularly for Barbados. So we used um, historical records of dengue cases over a 20 year period. And we found that by interacting long and short lag uh, values of the standardized precipitation index, we could identify different patterns that represent high risk of dengue. So for example, if we were to observe hot and dry conditions, and then had a forecast for exceptionally wet conditions several months later, then the model would produce a high risk uh, forecast of dengue outbreaks. Whereas if conditions were observed to be cool and dry and the forecasts were for uh, dry conditions to continue, then the model would produce a low risk of dengue outbreaks. 
And we're working now to try and overcome this implementation challenge uh, with our partners in the Caribbean, particularly in the Barbados Meteorological Services and the Ministry of Health and Wellness in Barbados, to see how we can connect a, um, a modelling tool to um, the climate services platform that's already implemented at the um, Barbados Meteorological Service. And we're exploring ways to adapt this impact matrix, which was designed by the World Meteorological Organization to represent both the severity of the disease outbreak and the confidence in our forecast at predicting that that outbreak will happen. So this year, um, I moved to the Barcelona Supercomputing Center from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And um, at the BSC, we have um, started uh, several new projects, um, thanks to funding from the Wellcome Trust. Uh, one of our projects is to develop a modeling tool um, called ID Extremes, which will um, produce probabilistic uh, forecasts of infectious disease outbreaks given these compound extreme climatic events. And we're hoping to develop this model and see if it can be applicable to not only dengue, but also other climate sensitive infectious diseases such as cholera and leptospirosis. And we're working with partners in Brazil, um, Barbados, um, South Sudan with Médecins Sans Frontières, and also in Nepal and Bangladesh uh, with our partners in the Red Cross. We also have another project where we step back um, a little and to be able to build robust data sets to inform our models. So we're looking to integrate both um, gridded products um, and satellite images with strategically collected uh, drone images and weather station data, as well as socioeconomic, um, demographic and health system indicators with our disease surveillance data. And we hope to develop toolkits in specific climate change hotspots in cities, in small islands, in the Amazon rainforest, and also in the Andes. This is an example of one of the drone images collected from one of our sites in uh, Loreto, in the Peruvian Amazon. And these kind of images will help us uh, develop some uh, machine learning algorithms to improve the way the coarser scale satellite images represent uh, the land use um, and how uh, people may be changing the way they store water and the availability of breeding sites uh, depending on extreme climatic events in these particular sites. So we um, also have another project um, funded by uh, Horizon Europe. Um, this is called ID Alert, um, and this project is looking to build climate resilience to emerging health threats in Europe and beyond. So we're working to integrate both the IPCC risk, framing of risk in terms of hazard exposure and vulnerability with the One Health uh, approach to uh, model in an interdisciplinary framework interactions between environment, animal and human health. And we are working in particular um, uh, hotspots across Europe, in Spain, in Greece, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, and also in Bangladesh to try and uh, develop some robust uh, systems to um, resist epidemics of zoonotic diseases. And we also have another project focusing specifically on mosquito-borne diseases, both in endemic and epidemic settings, building on some uh, previous uh, project that we uh, developed, funded by the UK Space Agency with HR Wallingford and the Met Office, to develop an early warning system which is operational now in Vietnam. So through this project, we're hoping to develop this for other countries in Southeast Asia, and also to link the kind of modeling that we've developed in these endemic settings with um, citizen science and smart trap data in places in Europe where we can see the emergence of these diseases to try and improve our um, epidemiological intelligence, to, uh, intelligence on these issues. If you'd like to learn more about these kind of projects, you can uh, watch this short video um, produced by the Royal Society featuring some of our projects in Europe and Latin America. And I just want to quickly plug um, the launch event of our very first indicator report from the Lancet Countdown in Europe. So some of you may have heard of the uh, Lancet Countdown initiative. It's a global initiative tracking progress on health and climate change across five different domains, including impacts, adaptation, mitigation and co-benefits, economics and finance, and political engagement. And last year, we um, launched our European Centre, and we have our first indicator report that will be uh, published tomorrow evening. 
um, alongside the global report where we report um, 33 different indicators uh, published by 44 experts across Europe. And if you'd like to um, attend the launch event of our Europe um, report, then please do uh, sign up um, and we would look forward to seeing you there. And if you want more information about our launch events, then please follow uh, the Lancet Countdown Europe on Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rachel. That uh, was really eye-opening, the, the scope and the breadth of the projects you're involved in. I think the Royal Society um, summarized that very well, computer versus mosquito uh, by Professor Rachel Lowe. Um, and we'll, of course, be keeping an eye out on that uh, really important launch uh, tomorrow and particularly the indicators that you mentioned. So thank you very much for sharing with us um, all of your approaches and uh, we're looking forward to hearing now a little bit more about um, other projects in your team. So I'll quickly hand over to Dr. Raquel Lana. Uh, hello everybody. So I start my presentation. I talk about the disease transmission classification for climate sensitive disease modeling. So the context is so in collaboration with Yasmin Almeida, a PhD student I'm co-supervising together Claudia Codesso from Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. We developed a protocol to classify dengue transmission regime in Brazil. So this type of classification based on features of the epidemiological cycle in each location has the potential to increase the precision of surveillance and control strategies. This is the, 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 the paper you can find using this link from plus neglected tropical disease. So um, in a harmonized project previ previously mentioned by Dr. Rachel Lowe, one of the um, objectives is to build a digital toolkit to allow researchers and users to link, interrogate, and use multi-scale spatial temporal da data to understand the links between environmental change and infectious disease risk in their local context, and to build robust early warning system in low resource settings. So here is an example of harmonized user case with the following objectives. So um, we are planning to apply and validate the methods in other countries and to apply the protocol to other climate sensitive diseases and also to identify changes in transmission regimes and their drives. Um, now I will try to explain a little bit the protocols we developed in this prev previous paper and to understand well, so what is app features? So to clarify this concept here, um, uh, app features are a features used to describe the shape of the epidemiological time series. So this is, was proposed at first by Taba Taba and colleagues for um, respiratory diseases. With app features, we were able to classify areas according to different dengue transmission regimes, range from episodic to persistent transmission. And these regimes can be used to monitor changes on the disease transmission patterns, capturing the introduction, establishment, maintenance, shift, and more rare, rarely, the extinction of disease in a given region. So, and how to apply it? To summarize the, proto the proposed protocol, uh, this is the flow chart. Um, you can see the detailed methodology on the paper, but here I'm just trying to explain very fast. Uh, at first, we need to collect the data and organize um, from the different sorts like health data and sociodemographic data. Um, after, we calculated the app features for each year and did some Pearson correlations to matrix to reduce the descriptors. Uh, previously, we, we calculated something like 13 descriptors. And after this, this correlation, we had 10 descriptor, descriptors. Um, 
So after that, we calculate a mean of the app features for each municipality because we did it for a municipal municipality resolution in Brazil. And, oops, sorry. Um, and after to calculate the app features, we did some cluster analysis to obtain the clusters. And with the clusters, we did an interpretation that gave to us the, um, the transmission regimes for dengue. And um, to do this interpretation, we use some demographic and also a climate inform information. And here is a, a, a table with all the app features we calculated. And one example is like the peak amplitude, that means the maximum value of incident cases per week in epidemiological week, years. Also, we have a length of the per period of cases. From this app feature, we have um, five app features, you know, and depends the characteristic we would like to extract, you can obtain different um, different numbers, different indicators here. Um, so here is the maps um, for six states in Brazil. Um, the polygons is uh, the municipalities for each state. And here we can see the persistent transmission uh, regime, epidemic, episodic, and the episodic epidemic regime. Um, uh, the Pará state, Paraná state, is a, a, a nice example that you can see for the this area that's most green and blue polygons. Uh, we have the episodic and episodic epidemic regimes, and this is at the, the temperate climate area. And the area you can see most yellow colors is a uh, um, most tropical climate. And um, here is the table with the main characteristic of the um, transmission regimes. So from episodic regime, um, the main characteristic is irregular and low frequency occurrence of dengue in a certain location. And the disease is to, in these places is sustained for a short period. And also we can see a low incidence. For the opposite, you have the persistent transmission and at these municipalities, we have a regular and high dengue incidence in a specific location and few or no periods with no cases. And so the transmission sustained for long periods. So, um, and now the perspectives is to apply these methods uh, for the other disease and also um, to to identify some chains on the regime's um, transmissions and their drives. To do it, we, we will apply the app features for each year and now do the cluster analysis for each year. And after that, modeling it and try to, with some climate and socioeconomic uh, variables and try to find the drivers of this, these changes in, in these patterns of regimes. Um, so um, this is a, a, a very important like um, approach because now um, we can make possible to evaluate and um, to, to measure the impact of these drives and these chains and also expect these results to monitor disease and as a base of elaborate predictive models because each regime has distinct characteristics and also need different indicators and model approaches. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raquel, for um, this really interesting insight into a very practical tool to better understand and categorize these dengue outbreaks. Um, thank you so much. Welcome. So we'll now Welcome. move on to our third speaker, uh, Emily French, uh, also looking at dengue outbreaks, and uh, this time in Singapore. 
uh, and balancing and looking at the impact of climate versus immunity in driving these outbreaks. Emily, over to you. Thanks for joining us. Um, hi, my name is Emily. I'm a PhD student at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where I work with uh, Rachel and Adam Kucharski. And today I'm going to be talking about disentangling the role of climate and immunity in driving dengue outbreaks in Singapore. So uh, briefly, uh, a bit of background about dengue virus. Uh, dengue virus is an arbovirus. It's transmitted by Aedes mosquitoes, principally Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, uh, which causes 100 million, an estimated 100 million symptomatic infections a year alongside 10 million deaths. Uh, and as Rachel mentioned earlier, uh, around half of the global population are thought to be at risk of dengue transmission. Uh, most infections are uh, asymptomatic or mild, but, but it can develop into a flu-like illness known as dengue or severe disease known as severe dengue. Uh, what complicates the epidemiology of uh, dengue is that it exists as four immunologically distinct serotypes uh, named dengue 1 through to 4. Uh, an infection with one serotype provides lifelong serotype specific immunity, but only short lived cross immunity to the other serotypes. So it is possible uh, to be infected multiple times with dengue um, with, or with these different serotypes. So moving on to dengue in, in Singapore. Singapore uh, is a city state. It's hyper endemic for dengue. Um, with year round transmission and Singapore has experienced uh, above zero counts, case counts of dengue every single week for the past 20 years. And here I've shown the, uh, the time series of weekly dengue cases in Singapore from January 2020 until, uh, sorry, January 2000 until January 2020. Um, and in addition to this, since dengue reemerged in Singapore in the 1980s, uh, Singapore has experienced uh, outbreaks of dengue with an uh, epidemic cycle of around five to six years. And these have been increasing in frequency and magnitude over time. And I've highlighted here with the shaded bars some, some particular outbreak years. And a key question for early warning systems uh, is to predict uh, how, uh, sorry, when these outbreak years might occur and how bad they may be when they do. And there are several ways that we can think about this issue. Uh, the first is to look at climate drivers. So as an example here, I've plotted the same um, weekly dengue case count over time. Uh, and then below it, I've put the uh, Nino 3.4 index, uh, which measures sea surface temperature anomalies uh, in the Pacific Oceans. And this is the five month running average. So this is used to define uh, El Nino and La Nina events. And you can see that um, there is uh, that, that these sometimes temporally coincide with uh, particularly bad outbreak years. So for instance, you can see that in uh, 2016. Another element that's important to consider uh, in the Singaporean context is uh, switches in the dominant serotype. So uh, most years, all four serotypes are present uh, in Singapore. And here I've plotted the prevalence of each serotype uh, alongside the same dengue case count as before. And what you can see here is that um, every so often there will be a switch in the dominant serotype. And often this then leads to a large outbreak of dengue because this is changing the immune profile in the population and people may not have as much immunity to the new dominant, to the new serotype. Uh, and you can see this, for instance, in 2007, when there was a switch from dengue one to dengue two as the dominant serotype followed by a large outbreak. Uh, and then you see the same pattern again uh, in 2013 and 14, when you had a switch back to dengue one and a, a, this large two year outbreak. A quick note on climate in Singapore. Uh, Singapore has a tropical climate with consistently high temperatures, rainfall uh, and humidity all year round. Uh, precipitation um, peaks between sort of November and January and highest temperatures are seen uh, around uh, May and June. And then the typical dengue season in Singapore uh, runs between June and October. So the study aims, our overall aim with the study was to quantify the relative role of climate and serotype switching in shaping dengue outbreak risk in Singapore over the past 20 years. And this is broken down into several questions. So firstly, I wanted to investigate what the relationship was between the climatic variables of interest in dengue cases and how do these varies vary at different lag times. So by that, I mean uh, the relationship between a climatic variable such as precipitation and dengue cases might be different if you're thinking about precipitation a month ago or four months ago. Our second question was, what is then the additional benefit of adding serotype information into this climatic modeling framework? Uh, and then thirdly, we wanted to look at whether these could be combined into an early warning system model framework that could give advanced warnings of dengue outbreaks in Singapore. 
So the modeling framework that we used, we used a Bayesian hierarchical modeling framework based on the following equations. So dengue case counts are assumed to follow a negative binomial distribution. Uh, and then the log of the dengue incidence rate um, can be explained by a linear combination of uh, population offset, uh, climate and other model covariates and some random effects. And, and these are broken down into a yearly random effect, which uh, aims to explain variation uh, due to kind of long term annual changes. So this might be like a vector control campaign uh, or a change in reporting, something that we're not including in the model that's changing uh, at that sort of annual scale. And then a weekly random effect, which incorporates seasonality in the data. And we're investigating several climate variables that I list below, and we're considering each of these variables at a time lag from zero to 20 weeks. Another method that we employed in the study was we looked at distributed lag, lag nonlinear models. And these are a very useful way of understanding the full picture of this exposure lag response association between dengue relative risk and the climate indicators. Um, and this can be visualized uh, with these contour plots. Um, and I've shown some here below from one of uh, Rachel's paper, uh, where you have the climatic exposure on the Y axis uh, and then the lag on the X axis. And then the, the color and the intensity of the color shows um, how to what extent this particular uh, exposure lag combination influences dengue relative risk and these can be used as uh, predictors in the bayesian modeling framework so we did this looking at the uh, data that we had for singapore and we found some quite interesting patterns so for temperature here i've shown uh, maximum temperature uh, and with these plots uh, green is a decreased uh, dengue relative risk and purple is an increased risk uh, so here we found an interesting non-linear relationship uh, between temperature and uh, the risk of dengue. Um, and this holds for most lags where low maximum temperature and high maximum temperature both decrease your risk. So it gets too hot for transmission um, at some points in the year. Um, with So here I've shown uh, the same type of plot, but for cumulative precipitation, uh, where we found a simpler relationship where increased precipitation at most lags decreased the risk um, of uh, dengue incidence. And then finally, we found a very interesting pattern with humidity, whereby the effect of absolute humidity on dengue risk actually depended on the lag uh, that we considered. So thinking about like a long lag time, so thinking about humidity five months ago, we found that high levels of humidity, so very humid conditions, um, decreased the risk of, of dengue, whereas low humidity increased the risk of dengue. And then we found this pattern was reversed when we consider short lag time, so at the left of the graph, uh, where we found that high levels of humidity recently increased the risk of a dengue outbreak and low levels of humidity decreased dengue risk. So we wanted to take these insights to build a, a simpler climate model that, that might be more practical for uh, an early warning system type framework, uh, but keeping these insights that we found. So we wanted to incorporate this nonlinear effect of temperature and this differing effect of short and long lead humidity uh, into our model. And on top of that, we also wanted to include some information about serotype and we thought about different ways of doing this. So we're including, uh, we tested including the prevalence of, of various serotypes, uh, which serotype was dominant, and also testing the time since the last uh, serotype switch. And then we conducted model selection using various criteria, including the WAIC and the cross-validated log score. And so here are the results of that model selection process where we compare models of increasing complexity. So the first model shown is a baseline model where we only include those random effects uh, that I mentioned earlier, the seasonal and the interannual random effects. Then the middle uh, model, the second model is uh, includes those random effects, but also the climate uh, covariates. So the, the optimal climate model, uh, which the covariates for which are listed below. And then the third model includes both climate and serotype switching. And we found that this was uh, the best performing model by both the WAIC and the cross-validated log score. Uh, so here I've plotted um, the observed dengue cases in green and the model uh, predictions for median dengue cases in purple and the 95% credible interval in the purple, lighter purple color around it. Uh, and you can see that the model is able to fit the data um, pretty well. Also for comparison, it's a little bit difficult to see, but the black line shows the random effects only model. So you're able to see um, particularly where in that time series adding uh, the climate and the serotype information is, is, is helping. 
As well as improving model foot, we were also interested in understanding how including serotype in our model was helping to explain the variation in our data, and particularly this interannual variation, which is really important for understanding which year we might have a particularly bad dengue outbreak in. Uh, so here, and the way we did this was um, by looking at those annual random effects that I was mentioning earlier. And so here I've plotted the estimated annual random effects for each of those three models I mentioned. So the random effects only model, the model with climate and the model with climate and serotype. Uh, and this is useful to look at because the closer that this random effect is to zero, the more of the interannual variation is being explained by other elements of the model. So being explained by either that climate information or that serotype information. Uh, and you can see that for quite a few years, the um, model with serotype in it is, is clearly explaining a lot of this intraannual variation. So for instance, here in 2007 and 2008, the green line, which is the climate and serotype model is much closer to zero. And then again, from uh, 2013 till 2016, which suggests that the addition of this serotype switching variable is helping to explain uh, some of this intraannual variation and in dengue incidents that we're seeing, um, which is uh, promising for its use as a, a predictor in, a, in an early warning type model. So in conclusion, then, um, we found so far that the relationship between climatic variables and dengue incidents in Singapore is complex. Uh, we found evidence of a nonlinear impact of temperature and of differing effects of short and long lead humidity. Uh, and we found that incorporating serotype switching into a climatic modeling framework helped to improve our model fit and explain our interannual variation in dengue incidents. Uh, and our next steps with this work will be to evaluate the out of sample predictive ability of the final model. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Emily. That was uh, really informative and always very interesting to see this uh, kind of very important parameter um, to all three models we've heard so, so far. It's kind of simplifying it so that it becomes uh, really usable as a decision making tool, as a policy tool. So. We look forward to those updates um, and just to kind of complement our session, looking at different models of climate sensitive diseases. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Martin. Martin, you'll be talking to us about uh, leptospirosis in uh, northeastern Argentina. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about one of the case studies I've been working on in the context of my research, uh, which is titled Towards an Early Warning System for Leptospirosis in Northeastern Argentina. To begin with, uh, buttons, yeah. To begin with, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the background of leptospirosis. It's um, many of you probably are public health agents, so you know about that. But maybe as a refresher, leptospirosis is caused by a bacteria um, called leptospira. Uh, it typically presents as a fever syndrome, so that makes it a little bit difficult to be diagnosed and many times confused with dengue and other um, similar syndromes. And it affects annually 1.03 million people um, with a case fatality ratio of 7%, which roughly translates into 58,000 deaths uh, per year. It is typically considered to be a zoonosis. And although livestock, dogs, and many other mammals are able to carry the bacteria, rodents are known to be the main reservoir. And the way that these rodents um, end up communicating the bacteria to people is through multiple transmission pathways. Um, we can identify uh, recreational pathways, occupational exposure, uh, and also associated with extreme weather events. And in the context of this study, I'm gonna focus mostly on the occupational side and the extreme weather events. So um, to understand how people end up getting infected and also to understand why leptospirosis is climate sensitive, we need to go a little bit up in the system and understand how the climate pattern is influenced in South America, particularly by one of the main forces, which is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is a couple, um, a couple ocean atmosphere pattern, which is characterized by presenting um, two distinct phases. We call them El Nino and La Nina. And they tend to have influences on the amount of precipitation in specific areas and also in the temperature. Um, as I said, there are two main type of phases. And um, the most important one or the one that we are mostly interested here in this case study is El Nino, which um, it is not homogeneous all across South America. Um, we're going to see, for example, that in northeastern Brazil, it creates droughts, but 
in places like Peru, we're going to have um, big flooding events and sudden increases in precipitation. Um, and that's where particularly where this case study is located in northeastern Argentina. So, um, yeah, just to, uh, this is just as a representation matter here, you can see that during an El Nino event, the sea surface temperature at the Pacific Ocean um, increases, it has positive anomalies, and that leads to an increase in precipitation and flooding events. So when these conditions change, we have an increase in the level of exposure, and that happens because we have animal hosts um, who are carriers releasing bacteria in the water, and then that leads into environment and contamination and people get exposed. In addition to the other risk factors that are already put in place, like for example, occupational exposure and recreational, although in the case of a, a flooding event, uh, that is very unlikely. Um, and when infections occur, most of the infections are going to be asymptomatic, but in um, 10 to 30% of the infections, uh, they are going to become symptomatic with the typical febrile syndrome that I was uh, mentioning earlier. And 10% of these symptomatic cases are going to become severe, requiring hospitalization, and that can lead to potential death through uh, kidney failure or uh, pulmonary hemorrhage. The thing is that when we're working with surveillance data, the only cases that are captured are the symptomatic cases and those that require hospitalization. And in the context of Argentina, this is captured by the um, national surveillance system um, managed by the Ministerio de Salud, uh, that would be the health ministry, and is regularly published in the form of bulletins. So in this context, what um, we were trying to do is to first characterize the effect of hydrometeorological variables on leptospirosis cases in um, Santa Fe and Entre Rios, and uh, two provinces in northeastern Argentina, and also to evaluate these potential candidate models in their predictive performance to start setting up a potential climate-based early warning system. So, we worked with surveillance data for these two provinces. This is made up of um, confirmed cases, and we can see the distinct outbreak pattern here. Um, it's normally made up of irregular outbreaks. So we see a big one in two, 2010, 2015, and 2016, but it's pretty much we have these outbreaks all across the time series. And also, you can see here that between the two provinces, there is a big river, which is called the Paraná River, and it's also um, a main, um, it's, a, it's associated with big flooding events. So we incorporated that, um, their monthly values, together with monthly precipitation values, and also uh, the Nino Index 3.4, um, which is, as Emily already mentioned before, um, the sea surface temperature anomalies in the Pacific Ocean um, region 3.4. So what we did is basically assume that case counts had a negative binomial distribution, and we develop a model in which the log of the risk follows uh, this linear predictor I'm showing here, which is, uh, first of all, defined um, by the, the annual population size, which we included as an offset, in which makes this uh, model um, able to estimate the risk. Uh, a set of combination of uh, climate hydrometeorological predictors and um, not only we use the monthly values, but we also included lags from zero to five because um, we didn't only assume that the impact of, um, of a specific um, amount of precipitation would rely only on this particular month, um, but we also assumed that it could have a delayed impact up to five months. And also uh, we included uh, temporal random effects. We included seasonal random effects, which is represented here by Delta uh, with the function random walk two and annual random effects, um, which we extracted from an IID distribution. Basically, these temporal random effects assume um, are able to come into place to replace all those variables that we weren't able to manage or we weren't able to measure in these two provinces. And that is um, one of the strengths of this methodology, because normally when we're working with surveillance data, we don't have access to this uh, information or to the entire information about the system. One last thing that I'd like to mention here is that we follow um, a modeling framework of increasing complexity. So we started by an intercept only or non-informative model. We moved to a random effects only model. And then because ENSO uh, modifies the patterns in precipitation and river height, we modeled ENSO models or the, the effects of ENSO on one hand and then separately the local climate. 
Um, that's why we have a set of ENSO models and local models. So to show you first here, the results, uh, this is basically to show how well the model fit. Um, unfortunately, I, I underestimated how big the screen might be, but um, you have in gray line the observed number of cases, and then in colored line, you're going to have the fitted values with a 95% credible interval. And you can see that it actually follows the time series quite well. And um, that tells us that the model fit is quite good. And also tells us that we can interpret now the effect sizes of the different hydrometeorological variables. And we see there is a positive effect of all the variables we included. And none of them included the new value. Um, so that means that in a frequencies approach, we would assume this is significant. So then we uh, proceeded to run out of sample predictions by leaving different bits of the time series out of the training data set. And this uh, first plot you can see in the y-axis is the number of counts, and then in the x-axis you're gonna see the years. I mean, it's a monthly count. And you can see that the predictive values are actually following quite well the um, observed number of cases. And uh, we also modeled the, the first model you see here is the random effects only model, which is a model we chose as a reference um, because there's absolutely no uh, model right now for um, a learning warning system. So the current practice is, okay, so we know that the rainy season is coming. I know that we know that the high temperatures are coming. So we would expect more cases uh, when the leptospirosis season begins. And you can see here, uh, looking at this value, the CRPSS, this is a relative measure compared to a reference model that tells us how much better uh, does the model uh, compared to this reference. So you can see that in Enterrios, particularly, um, the ENSO model with a two month lag had uh, an almost 40% increase in predictive ability compared to the reference model. And the local climate model had a 29% increase in uh, compared to the reference model. Unfortunately, we did not see such a strong improvement for Santa Fe that might be associated with uh, the lack of information we had, for example, about other water bodies that are flowing across the province. But when we evaluated the ability of the models to detect the outbreaks, we noticed that the ENSO models were very good at, um, had a very high hit rate. That is, um, it predicted very well the number of outbreaks, but then the local climate model with a one month lag um, had the ability to reduce the false alarm rate. So this allowed us to suggest probably that a two, uh, two stage stagger, um, stagger approach might be useful for a potential early warning system in Navis in Argentina. So this is an example of how this two stage stagger approach might work. This is um, calculating the outbreak probability for March, 2010. We had a first prediction done with um, in Nino index 3.4 in December, 20, 2009. And we see that the outbreak probability is uh, 84%. And then a second stage prediction with local climate in February, 2010 gave us an outbreak probability of 80, sorry, I can see the number 89%. So um, if I was a public health official, I would be deploying intervention strategies to prevent these outbreaks from happening. For example, one way of doing that is by deploying um, pre-exposure prophylaxis or identifying population at risk, like for example, people living in slums or close to uh, flood prone areas. So uh, some closing remarks. Leptos one of the really positive things about lepto leptospirosis is that it is so climate sensitive that it has very promising potential for a climate-based early warning system in Northeast Argentina. Um, of course, now the next steps would be to assess the role, I mean, how useful would be to use predict um, forecasts of the predictors. So that could possibly increase the lead time until the outbreak occurs. Um, this is another example as, as what Raquel, Rachel, and Emily have already shown today but how climate services can be tailored for public health purposes. And then last but not least, in the context of a, a global change, um, we need to keep developing these prediction tools in order to protect people because these vulnerable populations are becoming more and more at risk. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Martin. And particularly that last slide, I think really uh, hit home and reminded us why it's really important to have uh, this session, but also this um, entire conference uh, in terms of global changes and where public health is going, particularly when uh, more and more increasingly we're bringing climate and by the way, our climate colleagues 
are asking the health colleagues to think more about climate. So I think these four presentations have given us a lot to think about in terms of, of that and also the methods and the approaches that, that can be used. Um, and certainly we've learned a lot about leptospirosis in its own right, but also as a great case study to then um, apply perhaps to lots of other questions, uh, a lot of diseases, sorry. Uh, at this point, I'd uh, just like to invite uh, all our fantastic presenters to perhaps come back, uh, shall I say, to the stage. Um, I'm sure that our audience uh, will join me in thanking you uh, really warmly and thanking you a lot for these great presentations. Uh, Aditya Ramadona is saying thank you very much for sharing. And uh, we've had quite a few people join us on the ch chat as well. I thought I will give you a few minutes to join us and say hello to to a few. Uh, Asmat Islam was joining us uh, from Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. You're doing a PhD in healthcare ethics. Uh, Pierre Fongusu, hello. You're a postdoc research assistant at the Center for Infectious Diseases in Cameroon. We've also got Dr. Fez Ahmed Raza from the NIH National Institutes of Health Pakistan. Hello. Uh, Abdul Fattah Diabate Mali, Michael French, RTI International based in the US. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for this really fascinating um, session. So thank you all. Um, I suppose we have a few minutes to uh, delve a little bit more in the detail of your work, ask you a few questions. Um, uh, audience, if you have any questions, there's one already, but please do post them in, in the chat. But maybe to kind of get things started, um, the day, um, this, this event, the, these two days are really about trying to bring together these two very different sectors, that of climate and that of public health and more particularly infectious diseases. And so, of course, for, for you, it's all second nature, bouncing and jumping from one to the other. Uh, what has been your experience of trying to bring climate and health together What's been really easy? What has been a challenge? And I suppose particularly working with data, uh, what are the main gaps that you're seeing uh, that you'd like to see overcome uh, in kind of your next steps? I don't know who would like to start. Um, if anyone has some, perhaps Rachel, you could. Uh, Hi there. Hi there. Um, I'm afraid, I don't know why my video is not working right now. Sorry about that. It's working for us, Rachel. So uh, we can see you very well, but I think we're hearing you from someone else's computer. I can't see I'm myself. Working. Okay, brilliant. Um, so can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, I think probably one of the, the most difficult uh, is, is aligning the spatial and temporal resolutions. Um, so often when we're thinking about uh, meteorological data, we're either working with point patterns to do with the locations of meteorological stations, or we're working with um, sort of grid representations of the climate um, across the globe at different scales. Um, so traditionally, um, seasonal forecasts, for example, were produced at much coarser resolution than the sort of observed data sets. So trying to uh, match uh, the different spatiotemporal resolutions can be quite challenging when you're trying to link back to health data, which either is sort of individual level data or um, data that's aggregated to some sort of administrative unit, um, some unit which is relevant to decision support systems or uh, distributing resources. Um, so that's been quite a challenge trying to, there's something we're still trying to address in our Harmonize um, project, how best to align these different um, spatio-temporal resolutions and formats of, of data. Um, also, we, we have quite a few challenges because often the meteorological data sets are, are, are quite, quite long records exist, whereas for health we, we tend to be limited by um, you know, the, the amount of time a particular surveillance system has been in place. So it can be very difficult to um, build statistical models using this empirical data, and especially when you're trying to detect intranial variation if you are trying to understand links between Sort of the phenomenon like El Nino, which has a cycle of every two to seven years, if you only have uh, less than a decade of health data, it's very difficult to actually attribute um, any um, anomalous outbreaks to a sort of a climate anomaly like El Nino. Um, so yeah, that's um, 
sort of length of records, spatial uh, scale of records, and I think also the the sorts of vocabulary that the different um, experts and researchers use um, to describe sort of variation and validation of climate information compared to health information. So um, I think it's really important to, before embarking on a climate and health study, to make sure that there's all the right experts and, and partners in the room before you, before you begin to sort of align um, expectations, um, knowledge about sort of data, what data could be provided, what kind of outputs need to be produced, and yeah, so this what we sort of term this co-creation process of before you sort of embark on developing some disease prediction model using climate information. That's really useful. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to add to that? I could add a little bit um, to that. One of the main challenges we're facing sometimes when we're trying to model um, the risk of disease and associate that with climate is how difficult it is to deal with um, some of the surveillance systems that provide information at a highly aggregated level. So for example, if we're dealing with a spatial context in which we have mountains or um, we have lakes in the middle, we're gonna have microclimatic conditions that are gonna change. So it's not the same for someone living next to a lake, for example, or a river than someone um, compared to someone living in the middle of a city. So when we have data aggregated to an entire district, um, we're missing that. And we're kind of trying to come up with mathematical ways of dodging that and um, maybe sacrificing the narrowness of uh, how narrow our credible intervals are. And um, that is definitely one of the biggest challenges. And uh, that's where um, creativity has to come into place, right? Super. Emily? Yeah, I think, I mean, I completely agree with everything said. I think what I would add also is what becomes really difficult when sort of teasing apart these associations and the, you know, the impact of the climate drivers is the fact that often we have quite little information as well about other important drivers in the process. So in particularly immunity, you know, this, this in-depth zero, uh, like uh, serological information that we had from Singapore is very rare. It's very unusual for dengue to know what serotypes have been present over time. Um, particularly going that far back in time. And, and so, you know, particularly information on the level of population immunity to a pathogen is, I would say, quite difficult to ascertain, which can then make it really challenging when you're looking to understand that climate relationship, because, you know, you could be mistakenly attributing, um, you know, something which is actually to do with an immunity, uh, a change in immunity or a change in, in, in some other variable, like a socioeconomic variable as well, if it's something really important that you're missing. Another common challenge for vector-borne diseases is, is knowing when the control measures took place, um, which is something that's very rarely recorded in, in a time mm -hmm. series that you can use in these kinds of models. So, um, yeah, I think it is very challenging, particularly when you're starting to look at diseases that are the, the result of multiple processes um, all working kind of together in, in kind of complicated ways. Wow. And so what, what might be some of your strategies to try and deduce that information or... It's a good question. I mean, I think um, <laughs> I think it's it's really uh, like a lot of the work that I've been doing has been focused on uh, using things like cross sectional zero surveys to to give an indication of, of what's going on with population immunity that then maybe allows you to get a, a a better handle on what's happening with climate. So yeah, I think sort of being able to incorporate these um, you know maybe less uh, sort of traditional or well captured. Uh, information streams from surveillance uh, surveillance systems is, is a good way of doing it. As Martine said, there's like a lot of sort of uh, model model building strategies that you can use to try and incorporate these uncertainties. Um, yeah, I don't know, Martine, what would you add? I, I actually, I, I, someone who tends to rely a lot on the mathematical part of it, so trying different functions and playing with probability. Of course, we can always address um, public health agents and uh, see if they can gather more information, if there is any way they can provide us with more information. But um, it is also true that public health agents are not uh, just working for one infectious disease and one, um, like their their jobs are already really up capacity. So um, we kind of have to find like a middle ground 
and are not able to use them or they require so much training before they're able to use it. So that's also something very important. Uh, I know it doesn't necessarily do to uh, the question you asked, but it just came to my mind that when we're trying to figure things out, sometimes we go too complex and then we have to come all the way back and find a middle point with those who are in who are going to be the end users of our research. Um, no, that, that that was a really good point because uh, my next question, but we'll come back to that in a second, was uh, how do you see your approach integrating with national disease surveillance programs? So that that actually provides a perfect transition. But Raquel, perhaps you wanted to add something of your experience of uh, working with data across these two sectors. I'm so glad you're back. I thought maybe it's something I said. Um, <laughs> Okay. My computer and all, I just decide to move and stay yeah. close to Martin. <laughs> the old way is the best way. <laughs> yeah. So I would like to uh, add some uh, experience I have uh, working with InfoDengue. Uh, InfoDengue is an early, early warning system from Brazil and it's a partner in, in with Harmonize also. And, uh, you know, as Martin told about uh, sometimes the complexity of our models can um, be a little difficult for the, the, the people from, you know, have sort of surveillance works and understand the results and use our mm -hmm. tools. And in InfoDengue, we, we, we did a, a, a great job, you know, with many, many users in Brazil and trying to capture their perception and how we can can a uh, training or you know what they need uh from infodengue and was very interesting because after that we did a training course a free training course for them it's available for free for you know everybody that can understand portuguese <laughs> can do the course and the course, you know, provides for them how to use InfoDeng platform, how to take an advantage of those, uh, uh, the information you can find there, and mainly how to understand uh, the data provided by them. Because sometimes uh, people from health surveillance, uh, they work with a part of the flow and they never see uh, the mm -hmm. end mm -hmm. of the data, you know, they provide. And the idea of the course and the InfoDeng is show people for all parts the flow that produce the data and, you know, that produce the surveillance and, you know, what you've done to um, kind of the uptake of the models and your approaches and integrating them in national disease surveillance programs uh, or at a policy level. How have you found that journey or that relationship with the uh, local, municipal or governmental authorities? Yeah, so uh, probably one of our, our best experiences has been working um, in Barbados between the uh, Ministry of Health and Wellness and the Barbados and Political Service. Um, so usually the biggest challenge for implementation is having a live stream of, of health data to be able to produce sort of up-to-date um, predictions. So in terms of our DMOS system in, in Vietnam, um, it, as well as the seasonal climate forecast, it was very important to also consider the epidemiological situation at the time of forecast and sort of project that, that forward throughout the system. And without that piece of information, then you're um, sort of moving away from you know, an early warning and you're more producing some sort of um, sort of a risk given this um, set of climate hazards. So I think the biggest uh, problem is not having a live stream of, of data to be able to update your, your models continuously and also uh, accounting for things like reporting delays and uh, different anomalies that can happen, for example, with the, with the COVID pandemic. Um, it sort of changed the way that we sort of monitor the disease, the way it's transmitted, the impact of lockdowns, of course, impacts the, the estimations that have been made from, from the models. So, you know, all this sort of changing local context has to be continuously taken into account and incorporated into the models. Um, so really the most important thing is uh, making sure that 
um, about sort of integrating real time data. Um, yeah, I think it, it, it's it's kind of a consideration that that we had with this, that work from from sort of the beginning was thinking about um, sort of how our partners would use it and. and um, like, like for instance, we're hoping to get a little bit more data so that we can look at what's happened since since the pandemic and, and how things may have changed in those couple of years. Um, but in particular, I would say for those the kinds of models that I was using for that, that analysis, I think understanding if you're going to be able to get the climatic forecasts or whether you're going to have to sort of um, use some lagged variables instead. And kind of as Rachel was saying, understanding what that time difference is whereby you know the time needed to implement vector control and, and for that to become efficacious i think that's all really important sort of when you're doing your model selection and, and at slightly at the beginning of your analysis rather than sort of coming to the end and then realizing that that actually it's not going to be useful because of something important but uh you know like how long it is for them to implement uh, any response action that's really interesting thank you everyone and it ties in with a question here from uh, someone in the audience, from Neela McBall, who's asking, um, to what extent are social drivers starting to be implemented into these models? <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, about the social drivers, I would like to mention a challenge, this information, because, uh, for example, in Brazil, there are a big database with uh, social variables, social economic, social demographic variables. And so, the, but the problem is this is a static information, you know, uh, in Brazil have for census 10 by 10 years. And sometimes, you know, we need some to evaluate uh, something with a, a time series with uh, um, year resolution or more, and, it's not possible to do it. For me, uh, when I think about the social drivers, I think more about the challenge, how to incorporate it in a model that, you know, we need a, a time series. And, you know, uh, for COVID, um, I have a, a work with um, Brazilian research that to try to, to incorporate with it, we did a, a um, classification, you know, uh, for the, the, the regions in Brazil by this variation. Um, on my side, um, I, I agree, it's, it's very static. And also, if I think it all comes down to what the end user is actually what the end user needs. Um, if we're trying to if we're trying to quantify, understand where a disease hits harder, and we're trying to measure the actual effect size of climate or environmental variables, etc., then incorporating social demographic information is vital, such as age, gender, at least. Um, but then, if what we're trying to do is to create, for example, um, a learning winning system it's hard to forecast, like uh, we have to make a bunch of assumptions about the social conditions um, for an early warning system. Um, if we wanna use social demographic variables, I don't know if my colleagues agree or maybe they have a different uh, perspective on that. I think it's highly dependent on the type of question that we're trying to answer. And uh, that in the, in, in the end uh, depends on the end user, right? On the public health agency. I don't know what you think. Dropping the ball. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I think we also need economic indicators um, really to help us um, sort of with the spatial risk mapping and to be able to pinpoint um, where efforts should go. At the same time, we do want to develop the most sort of parsimonious models possible because the more complex it gets, um, the difficult, uh, more difficult it becomes to sort of forecast into the future. And, and we're also very interested in how these um, hydrogen extremes interact with the underlying socioeconomic vulnerabilities to, to be able to understand how these um, climate extremes may impact um, different vulnerability groups is, is, is quite important for targeting um, the limited resources. Super. Emily? Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything that's been said, and I think it, it's 
it's kind of a tricky question to answer very generally because it really depends on the disease system you're thinking about and the context that you're thinking about. And, um, you know, that in itself, I think, uh, is one of the reasons why the sort of co-creation approach that Rachel mentioned is so important because as, uh, you know, as a modeler or as an epidemiologist, it can be hard to come in and, and understand, you know, what are the particular sort of indicators of particular vulnerabilities or, or particular sort of uh, geographic features or, or so on that, that might be particularly important for that context because you know even the examples that we've discussed today i think the things that would be important for like leptospirosis in argentina or dengue in singapore like would be completely different um connected question here from Catherine brown who first starts off by thanking you all for presenting such interesting and diverse approaches to modeling uh Catherine asks given the lack of given that the lack of reporting can be an issue for many diseases how important is the incorporation of pseudo absences in your models? And if so, what strategies do you use? I see Martin is nodding quite <laughs> knowingly. I have to stop being so expressive. Um, <laughs> Get called on all the time. <laughs> I think uh, all of us have shown examples uh, using different ways of accounting for that. Um, I, Typically, we use um, random effects and we test a different range of functions um, to account for that, um, that, that lack of information. And uh, there are sensitivity analyses that can be done to check whether it's the right approach and how much it impacts on the model itself. And also one of the things that we do that um, I think, yeah, Emily, um, I don't know if you showed it in one of the slides, but one of the things that we tend to do every time we use this type of, of function is to check what's the end role they had. Um, so typically we would compare a model that only has these random functions, and then we would compare the same model with the random functions and the explanatory variables. And we would see, okay, so if uh, these functions became null, or uh, that means that the role actually has been completely replaced by the explanatory variables that we included. In our systems, that typically doesn't happen um, because there's always a bit of information that we don't have. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would add. Um, I don't know if anyone else has something to add about that. Well, we had a, um, an example of a study actually about the um, public and the identify missing places of um, Zika in, in Canada Reef in Brazil. So we used a sort of spatial clustering technique to, to have a look at the distribution of um, reported dengue and chikungunya cases combined with um, microcephaly cases as being vector disease rather than emerging disease. So sometimes, um, yeah, by sort of comparing similar uh, yet contrasting viruses can, can be one way of doing that. And that's also where environmental monitoring can really help. Um, we often have a lot of misdiagnosis between um, dengue and leptospirosis, but if, if, the, if the, um, we have like, elevated cases of dengue, perhaps in a urban slum, which is also kind of flooding, then that might be an indicator to sort of be um, monitoring for leptospirosis as well. So um, there are a few different techniques that can be used to try and account for this misreporting. Um, when you have sort of a lack of reporting altogether, and that's sometimes where the climatic indicators can come in handy. So trying to understand the climatic suitability for the transmission of a certain pathogen, given that it's being introduced in the environment. So yeah, that's just some of the ways we can think about it. Um, and I just would like to add that I I I work with some different disease in Brazil, and for all of them, um, it's interesting when we see by region because Brazil has five thousand five hundred seventy municipalities distribu distributed in five micro regions, and so when we see the differences by region. Um, linked to human resources again, linked to the training and, you know, available people to do the work. As Martin mentioned, sometimes they work as a top, you know, they accumulate many, many uh, um, tasks and, you know, it's quite complicated and, and it's important to do, uh, it's important to have methods 
to uh, um, try to correct and minimize uh, these under, under reports, but also understand why this happened. You know, I think I just like to, uh, to, to, to put on discussion this because it's not, uh, uh, you know, it's important because when you know why these things happen, we also can um, do something to, to understand and stay together, all of these people. And so what's happened here? What do you need and why? And I think it's a way to engage with these people. Um, one of the questions was uh, specifically about your model, and it was um, on the extent to which random effects are controlling the model, and also autocorrelation. Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. So, as kind of Martin mentioned as well in the in the last sort of slide of my presentation, that was the kind of plot that I was showing was was trying to show. Um, you know, to what extent, including the explanatory variables in the model, has enabled us to basically reduce our reliance on those random effects. And and it was quite interesting because for the um, modeling for Singapore uh, that I presented, there were quite a few years where um, particularly including serotype information really helped to uh, explain that interannual variation. So those, those annual random effects were having uh, much less impact on the model because um, that work was sort of being done by the actual explanatory variables uh, instead. Uh, and interestingly, there were some years where it wasn't having effects, and those tended to be particularly the years before when I had ser serotype information, so it kind of proved the utility as well. Um, with regards to the seasonal autocorrelation, um, that is an, an important part of the model, but that's the need to sort of fully rely on particularly these annual random effects to explain these outlier years. Um, yeah, with, I, I can quickly answer the question about dengue during COVID because it was quite interesting. There was some analysis done in Singapore, and I think the effect has been different in different places. Um, but in Singapore, they found that uh, dengue incidents in, increased uh, during COVID, which um, researchers there um, explained by the fact that uh, you're more likely to get infected at home than you are in your workplace, and, and people obviously weren't going to work. So... Um, they saw increasing levels during COVID, but but I know that the opposite trend has been seen in in some other places, which is quite interesting. Thank you, Emily, for that. And um, there's never really enough time to uh, explore and answer all the questions that and all the things that you've made us think about. We've really enjoyed this very rich session, hearing from Argentina and Brazil and Singapore and from your wonderful team uh, based for a large part in Barcelona and also at the LSHTM. So, uh, you know, a huge thank you. I think it's only the beginning and we'd love to hear a lot more from, from your work. I'm sure you've helped and inspired a lot of the people tuning into this session uh, on how to improve or refine their own work. So a very big thank you. I think uh, Edith Noanko has summarized the sentiment very well. I am surely benefiting from the wealth of experience of these experts. Thanks for sharing your experiences. And Edith is tuning in from the Department of Parasitology and Entomology at the Namdi Azikiwe University, Aqua in Nigeria. So thank you, Edith. Thank you, speakers. And um, you know, a big thank you to everyone who tuned in today. And uh, hope that we can catch up very soon again. And I'm sure we've all enjoyed the session a lot. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.